and welcome back to Teens on Topic Social Distancing Version. I'm your host, Cedric Hughes, and today I'm joined by two special guests, Ben Skinner and Zoe Poppingay. Today, we'll be talking about our government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So, Zoe and Ben, first, let's start off on a national level. Every day, we hear um, more news coming out of the Trump administration and our United States government about our response to the coronavirus. What do you guys think about our national, our federal government's response to this pandemic? Uh, Ben? I think what's interesting is that we're hearing so much news on both sides. Some people are are saying that Trump's doing a really bad job dealing with it and that the entire federal government's doing a really bad job. And then some people say that it's been fine overall. And as a non-medical professional, it's really hard to be able to make that judgment call as to whether or not the response has been effective. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I think just looking at kind of how it's worked out in, in, the, in the U.S., I would say there are a lot of people who would probably say that it has not been a very effective response since mm-hmm. we've had so many people dying, so many people being in, infected, especially compared to a lot of other countries. So I think it's really tough, like I said, for a person who doesn't know the medicine world to be able to judge how effectively the government's been able to respond But my inclination, at least, is to say that the response has not been as effective as it could have been. Mm -hmm. I agree. Like, there's a lot of people arguing, well, we don't know. We don't know how much better this could have been handled in the first place. But there are also a lot of people saying that Trump did not heed the warnings of China or of any other country that this was going to hit and this was going to hit really big. So Trump not listening to that, um, I know, is a really um, I know is a really prominent argument that I've heard a lot about. But it's just, um, I, yeah, again, I have a non-medical um, perspective as well on this, but it seems like it could have been handled a lot better. And um, I understand leaving a lot of this quarantine health uh, crisis thing to the states, but states like Florida, who are just totally disregarding um, all the safety warnings from scientists, from doctors, even from some politicians to stay home and stay safe. They're just complete disregard of this. Um, that's not necessarily national, that's specific to their state, but uh, it's just, I don't want to be associated with that kind of carelessness of this pandemic. Sure. Yeah. So you guys both talk about um, President Trump when talking about the federal government's response. And I think, you know, a lot of Americans remember when um, he first addressed the nation concerning the coronavirus. Um, I'm sure you guys remember the press conference where he had said, you know, uh, soon those 15 cases will be down to zero. Yeah. And we're set to uh, to shoot over 900,000 cases um, if we haven't already. So uh, clearly, you know, we, we didn't go down um, uh, quite as quickly as, as those at the top thought we would. Um, but it's it's more than just um, Trump's response as well. It's also Congress as well. So we see um, in seemingly, you know, in, in these times of political polarization, uh, a, a seemingly unprecedented move by Democrats and Republicans to come together to um, create the coronavirus stimulus package. So this was a $2 trillion package um, passed by Congress uh, in efforts to mitigate the impacts of COVID-19 on the American people. So how familiar are you two with this stimulus package that Congress passed and its effects that it's had? Well, what I've heard a lot of is the whole idea of, of the uh, small business loan. Mm-hmm. It's like you're talking about that too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I've heard of actually some larger businesses receiving those small business loans and, and then returning them because there was so much backlash that it was being given to larger businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think what's important is that the money that's being given to these businesses and, and just money that's being distributed in general actually ends up being used for what it's supposed to be used for. Like it's not very helpful to give a business money and, and then have all of that money sit in a bank account till this crisis is, is over. If people aren't spending it, then it's not going to be helpful. So if the money is to a business, it needs to be used to keep that business open and paying employees. And if it's to an, an individual, then it, it needs to be going and being spent by that person because throwing money at a problem isn't going to make it go away if the people are just taking that money and hoarding it. Yeah. Uh, Zoe, what do you think? Um, I'm with um, I'm with everything that Ben said. Unfortunately, I don't really understand that much about the stimulus package. So I was wondering if you could give some context regarding to the, regarding that. 
Sure. Yeah. So um, like what Ben had talked about with these um, larger companies, um, two included um, Shake Shack and Ruth Chris's uh, Steakhouse, um, were two of those large companies that took out of a $350 billion fund that uh, Congress made that was supposed to go to small businesses. And, and this is what um, Ben was referring to. However, unfortunately, uh, Congress's definition of a small business was a business with um, under 500 employees. And I, I don't think, you know, anyone's uh, definition of a small business would be something that has under 500 employees. I, I think, uh, for myself at least, when I think of a small business, I think of, you know, kind of a, a corner store or a local laundromat or a local restaurant. Um, and it, more than just the 500 employees, you know, after they set those guidelines, that was when lobbyists came in. And they made it so that co um, companies um, that were hardest hit, like hotels, um, could get uh, money from the $350 billion fund that had over 500 employees. Um, and we also, so Shake Shack, which was one of the companies that um, Ben was talking about, um, they have some 7,000 employees. Um, so again, you know, we saw that these rules, you know, already giving a lot of room as to what could be called a small business um, were kind of loose, right? And the problem that a lot of Americans had with this uh, wasn't that companies like Shake Shack um, or Ruth Chris were getting money. It was that they were getting money from the $350 billion that was meant for small businesses. There was another pot of money that was allocated um, for companies that were um, mid to large size, so that Shake Shack or Ruth Chris should have been taking out of. Um, now, Shake Shack um, got uh, $10 million, and they, they've since returned that. Um, and Ruth Chris also, uh, just today, returned the $10 million that they got from the stimulus package um, facing the backlash. So uh, just as a little bit of fill-in um, for information that uh, you were asking for there. Mm, um, yeah, of course. So now, what this money was meant for was the Paycheck Protection Program. So companies were to get uh, two and a half months um, worth of payroll money in order to pay their employees. So for most companies, um, small companies, this averaged out to be around $200,000. Now, we've seen um, just the devastating impacts of COVID-19 on the American people, not just in a health arena, like what we were talking about um, in the um, federal government's response when talking about Trump, but also in, a jo in, the, in the job market. So we've seen over 20 million Americans now file for unemployment. And um, just recently, I'm sure you guys have heard about the stimulus checks that have gone out, the $1,200 stimulus checks. So in your guys' opinions, do you think that um, these responses, the, per, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, the $350 billion for small businesses, the $2 trillion overall that was passed um, to bail out industries and um, individuals alike, do you think that that was not enough um, according or too much? I think it's not enough because obviously the crisis is persisting. But I don't think that's necessarily the fault of the government because it's not something where there's an easy solution in sight that they're, they're not taking. I think they're doing the best they can and that might not be enough, but it still is the best that they can do as far as I know. So while we would hope that they would be able to take steps that would be more effective and would be able to just immediately completely make all of these problems go away, that's really not something that it's reasonable for us to hope for. So while I would say not enough, I, I also don't hold it against the government. I don't think they're being lazy or incompetent. I just think it's a tough issue to work out and nobody really knows how to solve it. Of course, and that, that stimulus bill that was passed, you know, we saw Americans were demanding action from Congress. So they were really hard pressed to get something out there. Um, you know, it, an 800 page bill was written and passed in under a week. So, you know, we saw the extreme amount of pressure that Congress was under. And, you know, while, sure, $600 million was maybe allocated to people who it wasn't necessarily meant for, it was still getting out into the economy and it was, it left over $349 billion for small businesses. So I, I think, Ben, what you say there in that it's easy to go on the attack route and look at kind of the negatives, we still see a government that is 
doing a lot. And, you know, the $2 trillion, that is the largest stimulus package that America has ever passed, uh, including uh, the Great Depression. So, yeah, I, I think that what you say is is really valid. Zoe, what do you think? Um, I would t I would definitely agree with both of you. Um, it it's not enough. It's never going to feel like enough. But that is definitely not. Yeah, it's not the fault of the government. They are not choosing to ignore the best solution. This is the best solution that they currently are able to give. Especially since there's so many there's so many different there's so many different angles that this coronavirus pandemic. There's so many issues that we don't know which ones to take absolute priority. Then there's the financial crisis. There's the health crisis and all that. So I definitely agree with both of you that I this is not something to really point fingers at the government at for not doing the best job that they can, because this is be the best job that they can, but the best, the best job that they can do, but the best job that they can do is not quite enough at this point. For sure. Yeah. So now let's take it away from uh, the national government and let's take a look at state governments. So we've seen um, governors have been making national news. Um, governors like uh, Andrew Cuomo and our very own Gavin Newsom, who have taken uh, large steps in trying to address the crisis, in calling out the flaws that the national government has had, and taking matters into their own hands. So we've seen both now on the West Coast and the East Coast, um, states like California, Oregon, and Washington, as well as uh, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and more on the East Coast, are forming coalitions to um, coordinate the reopening of their states. And this has been uh, much to the annoyance of Donald Trump, um, but we've seen um, press conferences with people like Gavin Newsom calling California a nation state. You know, I, I'm sure something that uh, really provokes Trump. Um, and these governors have all been saying that because the federal government has failed in their duties to protect the people of the state, that they are no longer beholden to the federal government in terms of planning for the coronavirus. So they have moved on with their own plans. What is your guys' take on this kind of interesting problem that arises out of federalism and the, the conflict between state governments and national governments? I think states being more involved in trying to stop the, the problem can be a good thing, obviously. Like California was one of the, the leaders in um, trying to take steps to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. So I think by and large, it's a good thing to have states be more involved. The more at like, the more actors are involved in trying to stop it, the more likely we are to be able to find an effective solution, I feel like. But the issue when states get too much power is that then if states want to do something that's not really very smart, they can end up doing that. Like, I think it's Florida is like, is not doing as good of a job at staying locked down as California is. So there's a, a chance that we'll start seeing problems there and, and the resurgences in, in the number of coronavirus cases. So I, I think whether or not federalism is a good thing in this case really depends on whether or not the states are being smart with the actions that they're taking. I think Gavin Newsom has done a fantastic job of, of handling this problem. He's been saying like, let's not pull the plug on the social distancing thing too soon. We have to kind of stay locked down and just make sure that we, we do this in a smart and effective way. I think that's great. But when governors of states and state governments are not doing things effectively, then I think it's a problem when states have more power. Sure. Zoe, what's your take? Yeah, our California governor has been really, really smart about this. But again, yeah, um, like Ben said, not everyone has been as like has been quite as intelligent with this whole situation with the ability to choose there's also the ability to choose wrong and florida is a prime example of that occurring um i still i still support that the states get to decide what they want but as i said before um as i said before i don't i i have no desire to associate with like florida or any state that decides to make those dumb decisions mm -hmm. sure so now, um, you know, we began this discussion about the states talking about um, some of the good things, right? You know, um, uh, California and New York um, and the, the states around them working together to provide um, effective reopening plans as well as doing their best to 
uh, keep their citizens safe. So we, you know, we saw um, Gavin Newsom, you know, we, we've all now um, sung the praises of him and what he's done for the California people. But we also talked a little bit about the negative. So Ben, you talked about uh, the governor of Florida, you know, kind of reopening maybe a bit too soon and maybe, you know, provoking that, that curve to, to go back up, you know. So we've seen we flattened it. But if we reopen too early, as experts like Dr. Fauci have warned time and time again, that that could lead to a spike. And, you know, that's what we saw in Japan and in Hong Kong. So, you know, it's it's something that could definitely happen here as well. So I, I think that that's definitely going to be something um, for governors uh, throughout America to have to keep to keep watch of. So, yeah. But now let's go, you know, even even one step smaller. Um, Ben Skinner joining us on the show. He is um, the president of Davis Senior High School. Now, Ben, what is your take on how Davis Senior High School has handled the coronavirus and what um, the Davis Joint Unified School District has done for its students? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I I think what's interesting, just generally speaking, is that local governments actually usually I would say, have a much larger impact on people's lives than do federal or state governments. All of the attention is usually on the president or the governor, but in reality, our day-to-day lives are probably controlled the most by the actions that people in our local community take. And I I think for us in Davis, that's a very good thing because I I think our community has done a fantastic job of, of handling it. Our school closed down before we had a single coronavirus case at school, it would have been really bad if we didn't close down until people started getting sick because by that point, half the school could have been infected without us knowing it. So I think it's good that our, that our school board and our superintendent made the choice to move over to distance learning. I think so far that's been done about as effectively as it possibly could. I mean, obviously there are challenges with people not having access to technology, I'm, I'm sure, or just the lack of kind of a structured school day like we're, we're all used to. But that's really not a very large price to pay in like in relation to what we've been able to do in preventing coronavirus cases from increasing in our, our county. We've had very few. And I, I think that's just an indication that the policies that our local policymakers have been making are extremely effective. And I, I think we're very lucky to have a both a uh, city council and a school board that is doing a fantastic job and is doing a good job of taking care of us. Wonderful. Uh, Zoe, what do you think about how um, our uh, school district has handled the crisis, or or more specifically, um, Davis Senior High School? I think that Davis Davis Senior High School handled it really, really efficiently. Um, And I know the school board is, you're not, you're never going to please anyone. And I know that the school board has been getting complaints, several, like, um, tens and hundreds of complaints every single day about how things could be better handled. There was the concern about internet and then kids who couldn't, um, and then some kids who are on meal plans um, because they cannot, they can't get a meal at home. But those, I feel like those were all handled really efficiently. Like within the first week of, within the first week of school shutting down, I know the school board um, took measures to make sure like the meals were handled and then um, internet access. Um, each individual family was reached out to and asked if they had proper internet access for their for their ongoing education. And while not every family could respond, just it's the efforts to make sure that um, every single kid can deal with this um, in both an academic and like a healthy and safe way. I just I, I think the school district has been doing a really good job. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I you know I think um, from this conversation, you know, I think that we all know that there's more that we could be doing on all levels, both, you know, local, state, and and national. But I I think that um, this conversation has also been rather optimistic. You know, we've looked at um, the doings of Congress and what they've done at a federal level to try and help the American people. Uh, We've looked at how governors have really come together in this crisis to try and lead their states to, you know, to the end of the tunnel and to get through this. And we've looked at our own um, you know, government here in Davis and what the school uh, district has done in order to protect its students. So that's all the time we have um, for now, but thank you Zoe and Ben for joining us. Um, until uh, next time, stay safe and um, enjoy your rest of quarantine. Thank you. This has been Teens on Topic and I've been your host, Cedric Hughes.